Uh, okay, this is episode number 55, if you can believe that. Um, this is following the other episodes that were uh, regarding the 2019-03, which is the Q1 release of Servoy. Uh, and this particular one, we're going to talk about the uh, latest release of the NG Grids web package. So we have moved to quarterly builds, and we are also now trying to time our uh, extensions. Uh, this is an extension. It's not part of the core uh, platform, but we're trying to also time our extensions around the same quarterly release cycle so that uh, all the updates are kind of coming uh, in chunks where it's easier to uh, to process them. So today is about NG Grids, which goes to the 2.0 release as of this morning. The uh, It was in a release candidate for a while uh, but today we uh, we announced the stable build, and I think we did a webinar episode number 40 was the last time we talked about this. So it's been quite a while. If you've seen uh, the prior uh, webinar, there's some new stuff, and if this is brand new to you, there's a lot to digest. So let's get going. Uh, we'll start off always with demos. I have sort of three examples. Uh, there are two different kinds of components, uh, something we call a data grid, which we'll get into, and something we call a power grid. Uh, and we're first going to look at an example that just shows um, grouping plus some filtering, which is new, and a bit about how to persist a uh, grid state. Uh, then we'll take a look at some editing scenarios, because this is also a powerful component for editing. And then we'll look at the power grid, which is uh, a read-only grid, which is meant more for analysis. So we have some uh, different features for that grid. So let's get right into the demos. <clears throat> uh, we'll start off here with the first example. We are looking at uh, a list of orders from the trustee example database. And right away, you might notice that we have some uh, filtering up, up at the top here for each column. Uh, this is new since the last major release of this component. Uh, and I will demonstrate what this could look like. We could filter, say, on uh, customer. So you can see that we get uh, Tom's, but also uh, Tomio and Bottom, all having uh, that string fragment. Uh, we could modify that a bit because it's it is by default contains. We could do starts with, and you can see that it's narrowed down. Um, <clears throat> I'll go back to contains because we get a bit more to work with then. Uh, and I could combine multiple filters so I could reduce uh, things down. Uh, you can imagine that we might want to filter by date, which will look a bit different. So we can come in here and, well, I want to do a before less than and we'll do say everything in 1996 that is also containing tom <clears throat> and you know we could we could do something here as well maybe we just do spain so uh you get the idea um these are all uh, uh values that you enter uh, I understand that probably the next logical thing would be uh, instead of typing in a uh, string fragment for a customer, we might want to have a list of discrete values, and you can multi-select that list. So we could go through and pick off customers, and, and in there we're getting sort of an in filter. Um, that is uh, something which we're looking into for the next quarter, so the 2019.06 uh, release to have discrete uh, multi-select values in the filter. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that's filtering. I also want to point out that that this is server-side. Uh, so uh, for those of you new to Servoy, data binding is really um, part and parcel to the platform. And most of the components that you see are data-bound. And even the complex components like this, which can do a lot of things, uh, in the browser, uh, still when it's uh, talking about data, that's data bound. So this is filtering on the back end. So you're guaranteed that even if there's uh, quite a large number of records in the database, that the filter is valid for all the records. <clears throat> Let's go into some examples about uh, grouping. I will clear out these filters here for that. 
and I just want to show uh, some of the grouping. This has been in the component kind of from the beginning, uh, but uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, we'll go through it. Um, we can, by default, this this grid wasn't grouped. It's quite easy to to group. Uh, let's do maybe country first. We'll do country and then uh, employee. So we want to look at how our sales reps are doing per country, and you can see the breakdown there. If I wanted to uh, set up the grouping to be uh, a certain way by design, so uh, initially I came into this form and it was ungrouped, but suppose that I wanted to have country and employee as, as my default groups. What I could do is come into the, I'm gonna come into the developer and, and go to this form and I'll show you uh, some uh, properties of the component. Uh, if we were to come into, say, country and set the row group index, negative one is the default, and that means it's it's not grouped. I'm going to set it to zero, meaning it's the top level group, and then <clears throat> employee will set to one, so it would be the next one in the list. Uh, so right there we are um, changing the default grouping, and I will relaunch this, although it probably broadcast in there. Uh, I think I've done something uh, here. So employee row group index was zero one. It should be. Ah, uh, I know what's happening. Um, I'm I I have part of my demo is to persist the grid state, and it's it's overriding the grid state. Uh, uh, what I can do is. Uh, come back to the browser and clear that. Um, actually, I can do that with this button, I think. Let me, uh, there, so that it reverts it. Uh, we'll, we'll, you'll see what, what happened uh, when I get to the next demo, uh, because it was uh, using a, so a stored uh, version of that grid uh, and remembering it and reapplying it over top of it. So uh, back on track now, uh, you can see that the default that I set up for the grouping by setting country and then employee. So it's not like it's totally up to your user to figure out the grouping. If you want to design a grid to be a certain way and you can even lock it out that way so that they can't change it, then you can do that. And this is one, one approach. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out about the filtering is that you don't have to have these filters above here if you don't want them. You could have it be that they have to pop it up to do the filtering. Uh, so let's take a look at how the filtering was done. Uh, so one of the fields uh, we filtered on was customer. And you can see over here, filter type is set to text. So the default would be uh, that it's set to none. And that means that the, the filter box won't appear um, and that this column won't be filterable. However, there's a property for the entire grid, which I've added here under grid options. And you can just click here and add it and then type it in and that's floating filter is set to true. So that's that uh, the sort of on top of the column, that's the floating filter is showing by default. What I, what I would like to do is clear that property and save my grid, save my form. And now you can see that that filter is not uh, available uh, however, if I were to come into, uh, say, <clears throat> what do we filter on before date? Um, you can see that there's a filter button here in the little toolbar. So it's still an option. However, I turned it off for customer. So you can see that the little filter button does not appear here. So, so you as a developer have some control over uh, which columns are filterable. And if you want to have that sort of inline filter floating at the top or not with a simple property that you can configure on the whole grid. Okay, let's uh, let's jump into how we might persist the grid state. <clears throat> so the default here now out of the design mode is that we're grouping by country and employee. Um, uh, but let's say the user does some changes to the setup of the grid and what you would like is for, for their user experience to be uh, continuous so that the next time they come back into this application, that they're getting uh, the grid for this particular form, let's say, uh, in the way that they last left it. 
So I'm going to drill in, say, from country to employee, and then maybe we'll group uh, one more on, let's do city, kind of in between. So we go country, city, then employee. So we've, we've changed it that way. Uh, and then perhaps we want to um, also hide those columns. So we'll hide employee and country and city's already hidden. That makes a bit more sense now because you see that anyway in, in the grouping here. So uh, now I need sort of a hook to persist that. Um, there are many ways to do that. I just set it up so that it's on form hide. So if I came into this form and came back, it would have persisted it. Uh, and now what I would like to do is uh, close this and relaunch it out of the IDE. And I should get that, uh, let's see, country employee. I had it uh, with country city employee. Well, let's, let's go through it explicitly programmatically. Um, I'll do this again with, I'll just stick city in between and <clears throat> we'll come over here and turn off employee and country. That is the way I had it. Um, <clears throat> I have some uh, code here underneath that is saying uh, to save the grid state, which I thought I was doing on hide. Um, and then on load, I was restoring it. Um, uh, maybe I didn't save something over here. Not quite sure. Um, I know it reverts it all the way back. I think I undid something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's just add city to the group and try this again. So uh, I will programmatically call this through the command console, which is a nice trick when you're debugging something. So forms dot orders dot save grid state. And what that does is it, it calls a method uh, on the grid to get the current uh, column state. And then I actually send it to local storage. So I'll show you what that looks like. Now you could save this in the database as well, uh, but I have this key value, my grid state. And yeah, you can see the row groups are country city employee. So the next time it comes in, it should, it should read that out uh, when it, when it first uh, shows. So uh, let's uh, close this and, and relaunch it and hopefully it works this time. There we go. Okay, so the, uh, that was me logging in a second time as a user and finding that uh, it is in the way that I left it uh, with um, City being part of the group. So uh, in, in this case, I wanna show you that um, <clears throat> Sorry, in this case, I wanna show you that in the script editor for this form, uh, in the on show event, I'm calling this method load grid state. Uh, and here I'm using my web, my web storage plugin to read that back out of the browser local storage. Uh, and then I'm, I'm calling this method restore column state on the grid component itself. So there's two methods you can call. There's um, when I'm saving it, which is here, uh, I'm calling uh, get column state and I'm calling re restore column state. And then finally, uh, if I wanna get rid of this and, and go back to the way it was initially by design, I, I have a revert button here, I click it. That's calling this method uh, to revert column state, which is down here and there's uh, a restore column state. Uh, and and there's one API call. So there's three methods there for you to manage that. It's up to you how you wanna store it. You basically get the serialized information about the grid. In my case, I put it in the browser, which means if I were to log in from a different device, I wouldn't get what I had done. Um, so if you wanted that, then you could save it in a database, for example. Okay, um, another example uh, that I wanna point out here is let me clear these groups and show you the raw uh, setup. Uh, you may notice that um, 
there's these dollar signs here and I've made a rule that uh, those are going to show up whenever the order total is greater than $1,000. So you can see any of any of these that go above $1,000, we get the little dollar sign. We also get a bold font going across there. I just want to point out some of the little tricks you can do. Uh, in this case, you can mix any markup into the grid. So that's how I'm getting that little font icon in there. Uh, let's take a look at how that was done. If we go to the design of the grid, um, you'll notice that there's a column here, the first column status, uh, and the data provider is a calculation display order status, and it is just injecting a little bit of markup with the rule if the order total goes over $1,000. Uh, and so um, you can render markup uh, if you want inside, inside the grid. Um, there's just one thing you have to remember to do, and you'll notice that there's a property here, show as, on that particular column. The default is text, meaning you just show the raw value that's coming from the data binding. However, if it's HTML, you want to let it know to, um, to render that as such. And then there's a third option to do sanitized HTML uh, so that it will actually strip out uh, unwanted stuff. Um, probably if you had something in there that you wanted to use, you need to to do HTML and not sanitize HTML so that the, the browser is still trusting it. All right, uh, oh, finally, how do we get this bold here? Uh, this, is, this is one other um, one other example. This is on the grid as a whole, a property called row style class data provider right here. And you can see that I've set it to be a calculation. If I jump into that calculation, it's uh, again re uh, evaluating if the order total is, is greater than 1000 and it returns a class name. Otherwise it's returning empty string or null. Uh, if I jump into the, the uh, style uh, sheet for this particular solution, which is this less file I have here, uh, you can see that I have uh, a style a selector called large order and I just make the font weight bold. So there you can see that that's what's causing these to become bold. So again, you can dynamically style cells and we'll, we'll have an example of that in a minute, cells and rows um, uh, based on the data. You can also inject markup and that markup can also be based on the data. So uh, we get people asking to do, you know, kind of tricks in, you know, in their grid and there are definitely plenty of hooks to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, let's jump into the second example, which is an editable uh, grid. Uh, so uh, for this example, um, I have um, I have a grid here which is showing the order lines for a particular order, uh, and we'll uh, just look at a bit about editing. Um, this particular uh, order, uh, let's say that I want to I don't know change the product. So there you can see I've connected to a value list. I can change the product there. Um, I This is just reading, read only from the product. So this is not editable, but I could also change the quantity. And you can see that as I change it, the, um, the values should change as well. I don't know why they didn't. The calculated value should change. Um, We'll look into that in a second. Uh, what I want to do is show you how to set up the grid to be editable. That's uh, more important. Uh, so if we come to the order detail form, you can see I have uh, the design of the grid here. Um, and you'll notice that this grid, the found set, is using a relation orders to order details. So even though the, the header is the order, the lines here, uh, the whole grid is based on that relation. That's what loads those records. Uh, so it's still data bound. Uh, and I put the data providers on there, and here's the foreign key to the product, but you'll notice that I also placed a value list and that the edit type is type ahead. So you have to change this edit type property if you want the column to be editable. You'll notice that for quantity available, which is just a lookup off the product, the edit type is none, because that would, that would be read only. Um, <clears throat> and then for quantity and price, those are both made editable, but the, the um, subtotal, which is a calculated value, is um, is uh, not editable. So pretty easy to make things editable. Um, 
<clears throat> you'll also notice that I disabled, um, or I can disable uh, grouping. So you might not want someone to be able to, to uh, group this. You could just enable, uh, disable row group and, and they won't get any of the uh, groupability on these columns. Do that here and I'll save that. If I come in here, now you'll see that I don't get the option to, to group by, and I can't drag these down here to group by those columns. So you may want some grids that, that where grouping is really disabled and you have control over that. Um, <clears throat> One of the other things that you'll want to do when you're doing an editable grid is to handle some of the data changes in code. Uh, so you'll see that there's an event on this grid called um, on column data change. And I'm just going to set um, a rule here that if, if, I, if I change the product, that I want to relook up the unit price from, from that product. So, um, and you can see that what get, what's get, what gets passed in is the um, the record index and then the column index that was changed. And I use the the grid API to get the column and get the data provider. And if it was product ID, then I want to go and reset the unit price. So if I select a different product, it doesn't make sense that the unit price stayed the same. So it would look it up. Um, and let's test that out. So coming in here, I'm going to change from the crab meat to Chai. Um, try another one. It was working moments ago. Make sure this is getting called. It is getting called. Um, Ah, uh, I've done. I know what it is. I I have a bug in my code here. It worked because I used the first record before. Um, this should be um, get record downset index. I just assumed it was, or the you know it's the selected record, but it's it's passing in the the index. So there you get to see live debugging. Uh, now it should be working. Let's try this again. Oh, I want to turn this off now. Thank you all for patiently following as I debug my example. All right. No. Hmm. Well, that worked. That looked it up. Uh, must be something on on. Uh, uh, some bug I have in my code. Anyway, you get the idea because it passes in the uh, the found set index and the column index. So you know exactly which cell and which record were edited. Um, it seems that something is only doing working on the first record in my code. I think. Um, <clears throat> so uh, so that's how you can handle data changes, and I attach some rule to look up the uh, to look up the price. Um, I want to point out that. The <clears throat> I should pick something which was I think out of stock. Let me let me just relaunch here to get it in a state where it was now we have let's see if we can get one where there's something out of stock. No. If I pick something out of stock, there we go. That's right. Uh, I just wanted to refresh. Okay, thank you. There we go. So um, you'll notice that when the quantity is not available, this one becomes highlighted in red. And although I could change, say, the quantity of this, now it's updating. That's good. Um, if I double-click on this, uh, it doesn't. It's not editable. So 
um, how do you do, how do you say whether or not a field is editable? Uh, and that can be done uh, through what's called an is editable data provider. Uh, and I'll also talk about how I got the style to switch on the cell itself. So let's take a look uh, back at this grid at the quantity. Um, and you'll notice that that although the edit type is text field, I have something else down here called is editable data provider. Uh, and uh, I have a calculation called can change quantity. Uh, and basically it's looking at the product quantity available field. And if that's greater than zero, it's true or one, uh, less than is, is false. Basically, if you just return a non-zero value out of your calculation, then the field will be will be marked as editable. So it does that on a record by record basis, which is why you saw that the uh, the first line was not editable, but subsequent lines were editable. Um, <clears throat> there's also a a cell style class, and we'll I guess since we're here, we'll look at the calculation first, and then I'll show where it binds on the form. Um, and this is basically saying if uh, the product is unavailable, we'll use the style class quantity locked. Otherwise, we'll use quantity OK. And if we look back now on the form over here, um, <clears throat> you can see that there is a, a style class data provider for that particular column. And uh, it's calling that calculation. And finally, if we go to the, uh, the CSS for that or the less file for that, you can see that I have two selectors here, quantity locked and quantity OK. And um, that's where the color and the bold comes from. Otherwise, it just inherits whatever would have been there instead. And that's how we got the, uh, the red to show up there. So um, I hope that shows you uh, some of the, the tricks you can do for editable. Um, uh, you can do handle data change and um, everything is data bound. And, and so you should see, for example, uh, as you edit, uh, calculations are, are updating here, et cetera. Uh, I have one more example, uh, which is the, uh, the power grid. Uh, and this is a different component, uh, although they're similar, it's, it's a bit different. So what I want to do is show you um, these are, this is sort of like a sales analysis, and I want to look at, say, product sales uh, by customer uh, for the year or by, um, uh, let's do employee and country. Um, and these are uh, grouped in this case. The one thing you'll notice that's different is the um, it'll show the number of, of records in the in the group, uh, and it'll also uh, should make these bigger. Uh, it'll also show the total sales and the total units sold. Uh, and this is this is right now in pivot mode, so it's doing it by by year as well. So we can kind of do a cross tab or a pivot to really drill down into what we what we want to see. Uh, we can take it off of pivot mode, and then we can just you know, run it by grouping uh, and see all the, the fields, which doesn't make as much sense in this case, unless we turn a lot of those off because they're really meant to be uh, groupable. Uh, so if we go back to pivot mode, you can see that that it's pretty easy to change what you want to look at. I'll leave year as the, the vertical or the column uh, uh, value. And if we wanted to instead look at, you know, uh, by customer and by, Uh, you know what's good as uh, products uh, and categories. So we could do category and product. It's probably a better example. So now you can see it, you know, year over year by by category, by product. Uh, this is just like the, the, the grid itself is different. It's read only. It takes a, a data set. Uh, so it's not really data bound to a, a back end data source, but it takes a data set, which is, you know, uh, in cash uh, effectively, and uh, it analyzes it within the component. Um, uh, so it's a little bit different. It's uh, somewhat disconnected from the back end. Um, it's also read only for that reason. So you wouldn't you wouldn't uh, edit these. Uh, 
Uh, however, uh, many of the other events apply. So for example, if you wanted to um, construct a, a pivot view that you want to give to your customers, but don't want them to edit it, that's possible. You could also uh, allow them to, to arrange the pivot or the, the grouping any way they like, and then persist it. And, and so that every time they come back, uh, it looks the same, or they could even save different versions. So they could do some analysis and then and then have different you know, slices of, of sales here and uh, they could come back and, and review those by saving them as different sort of grid configurations. It's quite easy to do. Um, <clears throat> if you, again, if you sort of similar to, uh, and I'll show this form, it's called uh, Power Grid. If you wanted to have something pre-configured, uh, again, you can just go to, um, uh, First of all, you can determine whether or not it shows up in pivot mode with this. Um, you can also, for example, the year was uh, one of the pivot columns. Uh, and you can see that I set it to pivot index zero instead of negative one. Uh, and then also I set enable pivot to true, which means I can drag it in as the, as the column pivot. Um, whereas the other ones I couldn't, it didn't make much sense to look at the other things as a column pivot. Uh, but if I wanted to pre-configure some stuff, I could say, uh, say we want to do a category and product. Oh, that's how I had it set up. Category and product zero and one. You know, that means it by default is going to show up grouped like that or pivoted like that. Uh, it's up to you if you want to sort of predefine how you want it to look, and then you can also uh, uh, disable uh, people from changing it if that's what you wanted. <clears throat> Uh, so that's the power grid. Um, it, let's look at the code behind that because I think that's important uh, because in this case, it's not bound to the, the same data source as the form. Uh, it, it just takes a, a, a effectively a cached data set from a query in this case. And you can see that uh, using Servoice Query Builder, I did a select on order details, which gets me kind of the low level data. And here's all the things I might want to aggregate by. I, in my joins and then I just added those and it, what's important is that these the names of your uh, fields in your data set match the data provider property so if we look at the any one of these they have this property data provider that has to be the same if those are the same then the value that you've loaded will show up in the grid and uh, all we do here is we run the query and we just call this uh, render data and pass in the data set. So if you if if you have other things going on and you want to change what's in actually in the data, you can do that as well dynamically and just keep pumping data in uh, without necessarily blowing away all your grouping settings or your pivot settings. So pretty easy to do this, but this is I just want to get across the point. This is a very different sort of setup than when we're doing the data bound to the back end stuff. Um, one last thing I want to show is something that I've done, uh, some configurations that I've done globally on the grids, and this is uh, new in this release. Um, so if I look at the on solution open, this is an event that fires when, when I first open the application, uh, I've set some default uh, options. So um, uh, on the um, data grid, I want to make, I like that nice comfy row height of, uh, of 40 pixels. I come back here, uh, you can see that this is quite some uh, nice spacing uh, and it's the same here. Uh, that's actually being set as a global config option uh, through that plugin. Uh, so that means all my grids, even if I had 500 of them, I can set things and it's not just row height. There's lots of properties you can set. You can change the icons, you can change, uh, really you know, fine tune or fine tweak the, uh, the grids on a global setting. What's more, you can override them on an individual level. So let's say, you know, for a, a you know line item uh, view like this, I want my columns to be a bit uh, a bit closer together. I could come into that form, uh, which was order detail, and I could um, also add the config option here of row height. Um, and the value I'm going to set for that is going to be, say, uh, 25 instead of the 40 that I had set. So 
now I'll, I'll relaunch the client and you can see on the first grid I still have that comfy 40 pixel row height but on the second grid you can see it's a bit tighter it overrides uh, the default uh, so um, you have some control to set global settings but then override it on an individual level <clears throat> the values that you can set um, not to get too much under the hood but um, the underlying library for this is the AG grid component which is a um, uh, really a, a third-party uh, um, library and there are um, if you go to their grid properties documentation uh, here's many of these properties that you can set now some of them don't really make sense in the context of Servoy because we handle a lot of things for you but um, you can imagine uh, just changing like sort icons and things like that um, uh, reconfiguring the tool panel that can all be set uh, through there so we have our own documentation but we also have links to this documentation because at some point you just have to go right to that source and look it up um, <clears throat> okay that concludes all of the examples um, I'm wondering if maybe we have some questions which we can have maybe those can come in and I'll just take us through a quick overview of what we saw yeah, there's a couple of questions coming in, uh, Sian. Um, okay. A question and uh, others that have any burning questions, then feel free to uh, to post uh, them. And now is the time to do so. Any kind of question is fine. We won't laugh at you, I promise. Although, depending on how silly your question is, we may laugh at you. Juan uh, asks, uh, on Servoy 8.2.3, when we use the AG grid, our application required internet access to show the component on runtime. Is this still the case in the latest version? Uh, I, that's a good question. I, I remember seeing this case. Uh, I'm not sure if this is solved in the latest version or not. I'll check with, uh, with R&D. Uh, the latest release was built this morning, and there is... Uh, I should go to the project page um, just to show you. So if you go to um, actually let me jump to the proper repository. So if you go to the um, the uh, project page, you'll get some documentation and you'll get some release notes. So um, this release was built this morning. Um, and I don't see something about the internet connection, uh, but I, I am aware of that case. So I'm not sure if it made it in this release. Uh, if not, it will be in the 2019-06 release, um, <clears throat> the Q2 release. Okay, and a second question. I think you covered part of it, but maybe not all of it. On editable grids, do you have to call a save function, or does uh, this does this happen automatically? How can we handle reverting any changes made? Oh, okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so you you don't have to explicitly call a save function, um, nor does it necessarily automatically save. That's more of how you generally program anything data bound in Servoy. So uh, again, you are at the end of the day editing these record objects, which are in a found set, which is Servoy's uh, sort of world of data binding. Uh, and there are two modes that you can operate in when you're editing data. There's uh, auto save on and auto save off. Uh, so if you have set auto save to off, uh, and this is like a global setting, <clears throat> then nothing that you would do in the grid would incidentally save something. However, if auto save were on, then yes, as you make changes in the grid, those get pushed back up to the server and then ultimately pushed to the database. There is a webinar we did quite some time ago all about this whole topic of working with data and editing and saving. Uh, so if you go to the tech webinar uh, homepage where we have all the recordings posted, I think the name of it was called Saving Data uh, and or Working with Data and that is all covered I think in detail in that webinar. Okay, so the expected behavior is it's the same as any other component in Servoy, right? Autosave and found sets and transactions and rollbacks. Yeah, it, it all works the same. Excellent. That's very cool. 
All right, that's it for the questions for today. I guess uh, this is extremely clear, or this is way above uh, the heads of many people, or people are sleeping. I'm not sure there are quite a few people in the in the session today, and they seem to be awfully quiet compared to other days. I guess everybody is uh, installing uh, 2019-03 because it is a very cool uh, release, I think. Yeah, maybe they're they're busy uh, trying it out. Um, yeah, and if you if you want to get this, uh, it's available through the Web Package Manager. Uh, so I didn't uh, demonstrate how to do that, but generally any component you can go through the IDE, uh, launch the Web Package Manager, and and add the component to your project. And I think in 2019-03 now, when you create a new project, uh, the ng grids, since it's a common library, is automatically installed in your project. So uh, one less step you have to take. Um, I think we can we can kind of just cruise through the overview. I think we, we covered a lot. There's the data grid, which we showed, which has the um, the editability, the data binding to the back end. So all the normal stuff you get with Servoy is available. We have the power grid, which was the third example I showed. That is sort of working with a cache data set. So really good for analytic stuff, uh, pivot mode. Um, and you can really uh, pump a lot of records into that. It is cached, so it's not like it's going to the database fluidly like the, like the data grid, but we see uh, uh, performance pretty good up to uh, 100,000 records, depending on you know, some other variables. Um, the third thing that, that I, or the fourth thing that I showed was the ng service. That is new in this release, and that was uh, a plugin which allows you to programmatically set your global configs uh, for things like icons, toolbars, low-level configuration, uh, and you can override that on the component level if you want to. So that's a nice, uh, nice control there. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I think you get the idea here. Some of the editor types that that we were able to show. Um, finally, uh, I want to just give you guys one slide about Servoy World. Again, it's uh, in November. The early bird special is still running until the end of this month, uh, after which the price goes up a bit. So if you are planning to come, make your arrangements now uh, before the price goes up. Also, there's some limited availability on uh, the conference hotel at the, at the cheaper price. So you wanna make those accommodations as soon as you're sure that you're going. It's at the Movin Pick. We did it there, Jan, was it 2007? Yeah, I think that was one of the earlier uh, conferences, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's a really nice place, right on the water. Very nice cool architecture. Uh, direct access to uh, to downtown if you uh, if you want to. Oh, and I, I'd like to emphasize on the fact that we are expecting all of uh, the regular attendees to also be at the hackathon, where you will be uh, coding uh, in a competition to build an application, independent of your uh, level of server. You don't have to be in a top level expert because a lot of it will be very functional getting uh, things out and uh, and done so we are expecting you all to uh, to join and we charge a very small fee for it and all of those proceeds go to uh, a good cause that we will select uh, together so uh, make sure to uh, to sign up for that it's very cool to do a hackathon it's a great learning experience um, and it also gives us insight on how you guys make use of the tools. So our engineers will be walking around their life and you'll be able to uh, show them what you like and what you don't like about uh, the uh, the ID. So it's also for us and for Sean as, uh, as, uh, as product owner, a great input to get to uh, life insight in uh, in how you guys use the tool. So I'm- Yeah, we're, we're also taking suggestions for the hackathon, uh, both what is built and also uh, if you have a charity that you want to uh, lobby for, the proceeds to go for, uh, give us a post on the forum or a direct email uh, if you have feedback on that. Uh, I'll put up some useful links here as well as, uh, as we take it home. Um, uh, the forum is where you can give us uh, all of uh, your feedback uh, and also ideas about the hackathon, ideas for more webinars, questions, comments, abuse. I think that's it. Excellent. Well, we run a little bit late, but we covered a few more uh, things, and we all look forward to seeing you uh, again. Do we have an upcoming topic, Sean, or is that still in the works? Our ah. upcoming topic is still in the works, to be determined. We have we have quite a number of um, 
uh, extensions that have been developed in the past uh, few weeks and months. Uh, but we've been so busy with releasing uh, uh, some of the core stuff that we haven't given those much attention, but they are out there. Uh, we have customers using them and probably everyone should know about them. So probably one of those or a couple of those extensions we'd like to share with you guys in a webinar. Excellent. I look forward to seeing you all again in uh, two weeks. We will post this uh, soon. Um, first place to go is forum and YouTube, where they usually show up before on the website. And thanks again, Sean, for all the work and the great presentation. Thanks.